all become uh, important contributors that support and sustain ecosystem services. They not only support biodiversity, but also support and sustain and protect people and their livelihoods and lives. They're essential for sustainable development and stable governance. Now, there are enough examples from around the world that show how socioeconomic and, and governance states have been disrupted due to environmental degradation. A recent study has linked the exodus of people from Syria to climate change. This migration of people has now caused a ripple effect of sociological and political change that has reverberated through the Western world as extremists have taken advantage of the affected and the vulnerable. And nationalism has risen in reaction to the increasing waves of migration. These impacts will eventually spread across the world, including to Sri Lanka. And today, much of the coastal area of Sri Lanka is expected to go underwater in the next 100 years or so. Now, these coastal areas are where some of the highest densities of people live. But think about, but, but, but you may not think that you know, 100 years is, you know, is, is, is far away, it's not going to affect us. But these problems will become manifested not as, as, as sea level rise or, or areas along the coast going underwater, but as socio-political disruptions that's going to affect all of us, especially as people, people begin to move. They're going to move in response to failed, uh, failed uh, crops. They're mo going to move in, res in response to searching for water. And they're going to be, there's going to be competition for land, for food, for space. And there's going to be turmoil. We will, we are, none of us are immu will be immune from, from these kinds of conflicts. So now, when the conservation messaging is shifted from biodiversity alone to include the socioeconomic and governance consequences, the significance of biodiversity conservation becomes not just about frogs and fishes and elephants and trees. It's also about sustainable economic development and sustaining human livelihoods and lives. It's about building climate resilience. It also becomes about stable governance and societies and international relationships. It's about global commitments. It's about human survival and it's about votes. So these other dimensions immediately push biodiversity conservation way up the ladder of priorities for the government, or it should. And the fact is that Sri Lanka does actually have a climate adaptation plan. In fact, we are on our third plan, the latest being for the period 2016 to 2025, and it's prepared by the Climate Secretariat of the Mah Minister of Mahavali uh, Development Environment. And the plan does, in fact, recognize that biodiversity and, and ecosystems are important for climate adaptation and that they should be conserved as part of the strategy. The watershed should be restored and kept forested and managed and maintained. But nothing's happening. These plans are, are, are being made with good intentions, but like all good plans, they seem to have been shelved. So this plan has to be resurrected and implemented and, uh, because there are some good strategies there, strategies there, including ecosystem-based adaptation plans, which should, however, be done to scale, not in some small, perfunctory motions to give the impression that something is being done. There, there must be genuine commitments to conservation at landscape or basin scales or seascapes. And we have to be able to conserve to manage and protect the important natural ecosystems from ridge to reef. But as a high priority, we must protect the remaining forest in the mountain watersheds. Remember, these are the water towers of Sri Lanka, as I said, where forested watersheds will intercept, trap, and release the rainfall in a gradual, regulated way instead of, instead of as surface water that causes erosion and landslides and floods that we are now witnessing all too frequently. Forested watersheds will also sustain the water cycle and ecosystem services. Water is life. That's a very simple equation to remember and understand. No water, no life. And these priorities for conservation are also the forests that harbor our irreplaceable biodiversity. Now, the remaining forests in the West Zone are now scattered as smallish fragments, but there are a number of unprotected forest patches that can be brought under a conservation system. Now, these need not be DWC or even forest department protected areas, but can be conserved with other models, such as community forestry using a, a scaled-up Candian home garden model, for instance. And these forest analogs are usually able to conserve most of the wet zone endemic species that don't require the large spatial areas. And the forest then will also provide the ground cover to ensure regulated supplies and release of rainwater to prevent erosion and natural disasters, such as floods and landslides. But 
we should also not be content with just conserving what's left, but also go beyond that to restore some of the degraded areas, to create the larger connected forest, which will also make these forests more resilient to external threats of forest degradation, and be better at sustaining biodiversity and the ecosystem services. But this should also be done in a strategic way. We should, not be, co we should be cognizant that forest restoration is not just about planting trees in random places. This will not get you over forest with all the ecological complexity and the biodiversity that should be included in the forest. It requires strategic planning about where to reforest, what to reforest with, and when to reforest, and how to manage these areas. But one thing is for sure, unless you protect these ecosystems, you can forget about any expensive and extensive infrastructure such as expressways and megacities because they will all become unviable and unsustainable. And there are already several examples from around the world where these types of mega developments have been left, left stranded. So building megapolises without paying attention to the water sources and the watersheds will be bigger and much more expensive white elephants than ports without ships or airports without planes. And there should be real commitment to manage and conserve these areas that are being restored. But as a starting point, there has to be commitment to protect what's already there. Restoration is much more expensive and resource demanding than conserving what's already in place. And the priority must be the wet zone for rainforests, which are much more fragmented and under the greatest risk. These are also the forests which have the greatest amount of endemic or irre irreplaceable species. And also the forests that have the greatest importance in terms of ecosystem service provision. So as a first step, all clearing of wet zone forests must stop and all remaining forests must be protected. There has to be strategic restoration where the remaining for wet zone forests can be expanded and connected. Larger forest patches are more resilient to external threats, as I said before. So we did a very simple analysis to present an initial proposal of how to go about prioritizing conservation landscapes of Sri Lanka. Now this is based on the presence, the contiguity, and the connectivity of the current protected areas and intervening forests. Now using this initial mapping, we identified four potential conservation landscapes in the dry zone. There is the northwestern landscape, which is sort of anchored by Vilpathu in the south and then extends northwards. The northern landscape that extends across the northern area. The eastern landscape that includes most of the Mahavali region parks. And the southern landscape that includes the Yala, the Udawalawe, and the Galloway complex. Now, these are the landscapes where we can protect, best protect our mega species, the elephants, the leopards, the bears, etc., by providing them with the opportunity to roam across the landscape. But remember that climate change could influence the availability of water and food for both wildlife and people in these areas. And this will in turn influence how both animals and people use the landscapes, how they move across the landscape and survive there. So the human wildlife conflicts could also shift spatially as people and wildlife begin to move in search of water and food or places to grow food. So there has to be some careful strategic spatial planning that integrates climate change into these landscape scale planning process. The wet zone forests are fragmented and the, and the priorities are not represented by a contiguous forest landscape because there just isn't much there. But with some restoration, there is an opportunity to link these fragments and create larger patches. It's a bit more complicated and requires more analysis. But to make it more useful, we need the most recent land use and land cover data, something that the forest department has but won't give out or use for these kinds of analysis. That's a whole different story. But the critical thing is that these landscapes and the fragments in the wet zone cover about 30% of the area of Sri Lanka, which is about the target that the government has pledged to increase forest cover to. So it's within the government's stated mandate. Now I want to emphasize again that this is a preliminary and coarse analysis that needs more refinement, and that this is based just on species ecology at this point. It does not yet take into account the ecosystem services, especially water, for instance. So we need to overlay the river basins on this and modify the boundaries accordingly. And the idea then is to maintain connectivity between protected areas protect the major reservoirs, reservoir catchments, and the riparian areas, and also headwaters within these areas. But now, some may say, but what about the other land uses? How can you set aside all, the, all these forests uh, when development has to happen as well? And there could be conflicts with development plans. The thing is, this doesn't mean that every bit of land within the identified landscapes will be forest and protected. We need good 
strategic land use planning within these areas to integrate these gray, the gray infrastructure with the green areas. The landscape that we have identified they will then become a matrix of land uses. Uh, but each will be clearly designated and demarcated based on its use and function. So this planning will make it very clear where the protected areas are, where the corridors will be, where the roads, the railroads, the agricultural areas, the settlements, etc., will be so that, th that it will lessen the conflicts for, for land use as well. And the actual land use and land cover configuration within the landscapes will be designed using ecological and human use spatial overlays or maps. Now we can use some of the larger species, such as the elephants and the leopards, for instance, as landscape, what we call landscape species. These are species that require large areas of land to survive. And strategically design the landscape configuration based on the ecological requirements, such as seasonal ranging patterns or access to food or territories, etc., just as we did with the Terayak landscape. Now, these areas of ecological connectivity can be integrated into the gray infrastructure using environmentally friendly engineering designs, such as these overpasses and elevated highways that provide for both human connectivity and ecological connectivity. They will then maintain the landscape structure in important conservation areas and sustain ecosystem services. The ecological resilience will also ensure sustainability of the infrastructure and not have them drown during floods or break apart during landslides, as we are now seeing. OK, all is not lost. Now, some of these ideas seem to be gaining acceptance and are being actually implemented. For instance, you may have seen in the papers recently that the extension of some of the Southern Expressway to Hambantara has included elevated overpasses to allow elephants to cross underneath. Now, these types of infra infrastructure have already been built in several other Asian countries, from Malaysia to Nepal. And in India, the Supreme Court itself has made these overpasses to protect wildlife corridors mandatory. They are now being adopted and implemented here as well, so that's a good sign. And recently, there was a proposal by the Sri Lanka Land Reclamation and Development Corporation, the SLR, SLRDC, to declare Colombo City as a Ramsar wetland city. Kudos to them. And this month, the cabinet committee was appointed to make recommendations on protecting all wetlands in the Colombo metropolitan area and for the Department of Wildlife Conservation to take them over, over for protection. But hopefully, all this will become implemented and protection will be enforced and monitored. And it, it won't just you know, be more rhetoric. Here's another problem. The National Physical Plan is also now being revised. Actually, it's probably revised already. Now, this plan includes several large metro regions around the coast and an economic corridor from Colombo to Trinco. Now, this plan does recognize that the central mountains are a central environmental sensitive area, but most of the hills are already converted anyway. Now, these development plans will also increase the area of impact on the remaining forests and other e ecosystems, including on protected areas. So, careful design of infrastructure, such as those, uh, such, such as overpasses, for instance, to minimize the impact footprint is needed now. Okay, so that's the green sector, but don't forget that Sri Lanka is on a blue-green track towards sustainable development, and we are an island after all. And as an island, our marine protected areas and its conservation is a disgrace and an embarrassment. All we have to show are a handful of tiny protected areas that cover a few dead and dying coral reefs. You can't even find these easily on a map. A recent survey showed that the Bar Reef, Sri Lanka's largest marine reserve, is now 97% dead. The corals are crumbling. In the meantime, we have all this marine biodiversity out there from a rich whale and dolphin community, including resident blue whales, to large pelagic and coral reef, you know, deep sea fishes and coral reef fishes and invertebrates, turtles, dugongs, and of course, a few mangroves that have somehow managed to escape conversion to prawn farms. And yet, what are we doing with them? We are allowing unregulated whale and dolphin watching to endanger these animals and the potential failure of a sustainable tourism program that could support livelihoods and contribute to the national economy. We are allowing unsustainable, unregulated, and illegal fishing in our waters to deplete the fish populations. We are allowing bottom trawling to destroy the ocean floor and permitting mangroves to be destroyed, including by degassing protected areas to set up prawn farms that we know are unsustainable. 
So here's what we have proposed, that we declare an extends 200 nautical miles or 370 kilometers out from shore in all directions, except of course where it's close to India, and creating this park will complement and mirror our green terrestrial conservation areas with a large blue conservation area to support our blue-green sustainable development policy. Now, some of the issues that can be addressed through such a marine park include a more holistic approach to a, based on a larger vision uh, for reef and dune and mangrove conservation that can include strategic restoration for coastal protection. It will enable better regulation and ensure sustainable fisher livelihoods and fishing practices that will enable Sri Lanka to then promote and market responsible fisheries in the international markets and take stronger actions to control illegal and, and uh, fishing and regulate unsustainable fishing. It will help to plan and zone for better effective marine mammal protection and conservation at scale. And this should then extend into the pelagic, the, the zone, the, the, the deep sea. For example, Asha Divas has shown that ships that exceed prescribed speeds make the whales vulnerable to collision. So we need to regulate those ship speeds and promote and ensure environmental and ecologically safer geoprospecting practices and regulate and zone these practices based on a larger vision and plan. There's already uh, prospecting for oil and gas out there. So we need to be able to regulate them. We need to make sure that those practices are, you know, sort of environmentally friendly, if, 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 if at all possible. And we need to prevent other illegal and unregulated practices that are now happening within our territorial waters that are, that's also depriving the country of revenue. And importantly, the Peace Park would also help to diffuse regional and political tensions by promoting it as a no-nuclear, non-militarized area while laying stronger claim to our sovereign rights within our territorial waters. And this last will become significant as the regional and global superpowers will begin to vie for access to Sri Lanka's ocean space and its resources. It's already happening with China's One Belt, One Road program where India is getting you know, their hackles up. And we will become squeezed in this power play. Now this will also put place Sri Lanka as a leader in marine conservation in the region because no other country in South Asia or Southeast Asia has declared such a large mega marine park. Now the proposal is gaining traction slowly. I'm working with some people in key ministries uh, to develop the concept and a policy note. There is support from within these ministries and some key departments. So we have some allies there and this is ongoing. And it's been slowly navigated through the system. But we need broader support from other stakeholders, including all of you, to make this happen because there will surely be voices of opposition to an idea like this. There always is. So we need a critical mass of support to counter that opposition. Okay, so to almost wind up then, E.O. Wilson, the biologist credited with coining the term biodiversity, has proposed the concept of half Earth to divert, devote half the Earth's bio, biosphere to nature. He says that only by doing so will it help to prevent at least 65% of the species from going extinct. Mm -hmm. This then highlights the magnitude of the problems that are facing us. It highlights the extinction crisis ahead of us. And that saving life on Earth requires big solutions and cannot be done through piecemeal, random, and small-scale efforts. Well, we did an analysis of, all, of, of the potential for all ecoregions in the world to achieve a near 50% conservation state. And Sri Lanka's ecoregions fall within a category we call nature could reach half, where there is potential to at least achieve 35 to 45% for nature. And this could and should be a much more aspirational target for us to reach for and contribute to a global effort to save life on Earth. All right, to sum up then, it's time for change. We need a paradigm shift from the 1950s way of thinking and we need it fast. This is not the time for baby steps or for vacillation. We need to think about 22nd century strategies and approaches. We need to think big and we need to think bold. We need to think at la landscape scales and prioritize our irreplaceable biodiversity and integrate climate change, which is going to be a major threat to biodiversity, to ecosystems, and also the human and economic dimensions. And we also have to include ecosystem processes and services into the planning matrix, which will also provide more justification for conservation at landscape and seascape scales. 
This means that uh, conservation and development must be integrated and should complement each other, which requires intersectoral coordination. It means that the Department of Wildlife Conservation and the Forest Department and the Coast Conservation Department should be actively engaged with the National Physical Planning Department and the planning processes to make sure that the impacts of nat on natural ecosystems are minimized and mitigated and important conservation areas are protected. But first, the Department of Wildlife Conservation and the Forest Department and the Coast Conservation Department must begin to work together and these departments charged with conservation should stand firm in the face of political pressure, which also means that we must have responsible political leadership, good governance, and consistent policies. The human and economic dimensions will also resonate better with politicians, with policymakers, and their advisors. The sustainability of economic development, including infrastructure, is predicated on a firm foundation of resilient ecosystems. So conservation is and should be part of the development strategy. Hopefully the policymakers will understand that better. We also have to make the legal fraternity understand the seriousness of the consequences of environment, de environmental degradation and abuse. That is not just about animals and plants, but it's also about people, about livelihoods, about lives, and national economic development and good governance. That it's about unsustainable explo ex exploitation of national assets and public goods and services by a few at the expense of the larger community, including the future generations. And surely it's got to be about human rights as well, especially in cases where politicians clear forests under, under the guise of resettling people in places that lack the very basic facilities and livelihood opportunities and leave the people vulnerable when these projects are actually self-serving land grabs and nothing less. Surely it's about human rights when they clear and log forests in environmentally sensitive areas for self-serving gains but cause natural disasters that affect hundreds and thousands of others. These are environmental injustices that should be treated with due seriousness and not just brushed off because of a lack of, a, lack of understanding or refusing to accept or gloss over for convenience the deeper issues and consequences. We need to make the corporate sector, you thought you were going to escape this, right? We need to make the corporate sector understand that environmental integrity is essential to the sustainability of their own personal survival and well-being and the corporate sustainability. That there is a responsibility to pay genuine attention to the planet component, component of the triple bottom line that they espouse and make significant, significant contributions to environmental sustainability and environmental protection. The corporates must also work collectively and not in isolation or individually to gain CSR points. There's a lot more synergy that can be accomplished and created by working together and with the conservation community at large. And we need conservationists and conservation science leaders and scientists to take these issues up and be heard. And the conservation scientists themselves must also formulate messages that are simple and easy to understand. Scientific language has its place, but not in the public forum. So I want to end this with the quote by E.O. Wilson again. The time has come to link ecology to economic and human development. A simple message of what's necessary, because unless we do this, both ecology and the human dimensions are doomed. So we are truly at a crossroads now and must make hard choices about which path to take. Thank you for listening, your patience, and for coming on this rainy evening. I hope that this will give you some food for thought and that uh, you will think about some of these issues that I have presented and that we can continue this dialogue in other fora and throughout the media. I also want to thank the WNPS, especially, especially Rukshan and Spencer, for providing me with this opportunity to rant. Thanks again. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ikumanaka. Uh, at this point, uh, I'll open the floor out to any questions that you have. And uh, if you could also stay, because we have an important message to share with you in a minute or two after a few questions have been uh, asked. Uh, are there any questions? No, about the successes of uh, these programs implemented in other, other parts of the world, like in India, Nepal. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so I touched on the Terrayak Landscape Program, or the Terrayak Landscape, oh, it's a program actually. Now it's more than a project. Uh, like I said, you know, we've had successes with, with species movements. Uh, it was designed for tigers and, and for 
uh, rhinoceros and elephants and other large species. But over the years, it became more than a tiger-centric project or program. It became about climate change. It became about uh, hydrology, about environmental flows, about community livelihoods. So the whole, we addressed all of those issues. Now that has been replicated. Can you hear me in the back there? Okay. That has been replicated in, in, in other parts of Asia as well. Um, there are three other landscapes in Nepal now. There's one in Bhutan. Uh, there are some in East Asia, in Cambodia, in Malaysia. So landscape scale conservation projects are gaining traction. They're difficult to do. They're not easy. It takes a hell of a lot more work. But the successes are much more sustainable and are much more, um, you know, much more uh, useful. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, it, we, we basically have to do this because focusing just on protected areas is not going to get you anywhere because the ecosystem is changing around protected areas and they're usually too small to support and sustain the ecosystem services and the processes. So we have to think big and bold. Uh, the, the public pressure and all sort of things, uh, are they? There is always public pressure. I mean, like I said, when we first began the Tarayak landscape, there were lots of skeptics. There were people, including scientists, who said it couldn't be done. But we showed success. And that's the only way to do it. We have enough success stories now from around Asia and around the world, actually, to show that you know, this, these kinds of big, big projects can be done. I mean, there's a, another large landscape in, the, in, in North America called the Yukon to Yellowstone, the Y2Y project. That's a huge landscape that goes from Canada to, um, to northern US. And that was designed to conserve grizzly bears and, and lot, you know, some of the large ungulates. Uh, my question is, there is uh, uh, some family of small cats behind the jungles of our parliament. Now, there is a move to uh, remove these cats and uh, take them somewhere else. But in the, uh, I have not heard of any harm done by these small cats to any people or anyone uh, uh, in the recent past. So, what is your opinion on this move by the government? I don't think they should be removed. I, I think they should be allowed to be there because those are probably fishing cats and there are fishing cats all over Colombo. And we should be proud of the fact that we have fishing cats because you know, it, it's a very rare cat if you, if you look at its range distribution. Um, a few years ago, we began a study to look at the distribution and ecology of fishing cats in Colombo because what we wanted to do was use fishing cats as a sort of a flagship species to help to conserve our wetlands, because that's where they live. So my view is they, they should let them be there. Um, yeah, we need to talk to the SLRDC because they have been actually very cooperative uh, about uh, letting the fishing cats be there. I didn't hear about them removing uh, these cats, but there is another researcher, Anya Ratnayaka, who is actually doing some of the research. I'll talk to her and see what we can do. Uh, OK. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vikram Nayaka. Uh, if I can uh, invite uh, President Rukshan Jayawadna to hand over a token of our appreciation. Thank you very much, Dr. Vikram Nayaka. Uh, so that, that's it for the day. Uh, there's tea outside, but once again, just I'd like to quickly thank uh, Nations Trust Bank, our sponsors, without which this uh, lecture series can't uh, be brought to you at a uh, location like this. And uh, Pro Image and Mohan Fernando for the support of the video coverage, which you can catch later when it, once it's uploaded onto our website. And CJ and Team Sarva for all the backup support and advertising. To, to actually communicate that these lectures are out there, available to you. And uh, that's about it. Go and enjoy your tea. And uh, it's a good chance to talk about what Dr. Vikram Nayaka shared with us. 
and uh, obviously I think we need to get activated and start uh, getting something done about reversing some of these drastic changes that's happening around us.